Okay, now I'm going. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Application Tuning Part 1 by Owen Williams, who's the Senior Consultant at Red Centric. Uh, the way we're going to do things is he will um, talk for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we will take about a 10-minute break, and I'll take down the WebEx at that time and bring up the new WebEx at the top of the hour so that then he'll proceed with Part 2 so that we'll have two separate WebEx recordings that I'll post out in community so that people will be able to watch the one that they missed or the one they want to repeat or whatever. So, so that's how we'll do it. I would like to ask everyone at this time to mute your microphone by doing star six. And then whenever Owen asks a question, you can unmute with a pound six. And I think that'll keep things quiet so that we can hear Owen. So at this time, let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Owen. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this, this session uh, I've divided into two parts. Uh, it's, main, it's mainly focused on the application developer. The, the sessions we had on Tuesday were mainly for the DBAs, but the sessions today are focused more on application development and the development team and the, and the changes that, that affect them. Uh, so in this, in this first part of the session, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the things that have changed in recent releases of Betacom that have, have changed the way that we develop and maintain and tune uh, applications and some of the things that we can do uh, to improve the performance of your Betacom applications without actually having to change uh, application code. Part two, we're going to go into to more detail about changes you can make in your code. But part one is a more general uh, introduction to the changes and uh, the, the things that you can change to improve performance uh, outside of actually writing new code. Okay, so we'll, we'll look first at the application estate that we've inherited. Most, most Datacom sites have had Datacom for uh, a number of decades. Many have had it for more than 25 years. Uh, and so we have a, a large estate of applications that have been, have been written a, a long time ago, plus we have some new applications and, and new interfaces that are being uh, introduced in the, in the new world. Uh, we'll look at the, the application architecture and how, how it connects to Datacom, why we need to do the tuning uh, in order to improve the performance, and then the application tuning changes that we can make uh, to improve performance without changing the application. Uh, we'll look at DB Utility, which is a core utility for maintaining databases and a lot of changes that have happened in that utility since a lot of the jobs were written, and look at uh, ways we can change the physical database structure as well. Okay, so the, the application estate that we've, we've uh, inherited here, we've, we've typically in the past we had large IT departments with lots of people with perhaps a lot of knowledge of, of how those, those applications uh, worked. Uh, and each, each department, has, each, each site has a different size of IT department uh, and the scope of things that they, that they carry out. Some sites are, are operating uh, on a fairly stabilized uh, set of applications. Uh, and new development is on perhaps other platforms or uh, you know, uh, is, is using different uh, interfaces altogether. Uh, other, other sites are still actively developing uh, new ideal and metacodal and uh, other applications uh, within Dedicom. So the activity differs with each site. The, the platforms now vary greatly, whereas in the past, mainframe was very much a green screen environment and a batch environment. Uh, traditional uh, applications like that. Of course, now the mainframe can do an awful lot more. So we have a lot of new interfaces into the into the mainframe database. Um, so things like ODBC and JDBC Java applications uh, now connecting directly to the database. Uh, you, those of you who are going to come to the session later on this uh, this afternoon, um, you'll, you'll, you'll you'll actually see uh, some uh, some some REST APIs talking to to, to Datacom as well. So there's a lot of new things that we can do with the mainframe that we couldn't do before, new different application interfaces, Hix web services, a lot of things like that uh, that you can do. Um, the programmers, programming skills uh, vary greatly from site to site. We have, we have some who are very experienced people uh, who have been using these products for decades, uh, but we also have uh, cases of, of outsourcing where we've got a lot, lot of new staff that are very new to Datacom. And so uh, teaching them the, the, the old ways of, of, of accessing Datacom um, requires effort in order to do that, uh, and it's, it's harder to, to, to obtain staff for, for that um, 
uh, set of skills. So what is, what is consistent? Everything else is changing, but what's, what's, um, what's consistent across the board? Well, the thing we hear from everybody is, is a consistent theme is they want to reduce the total cost of ownership of the mainframe. Uh, we're always being pushed to do more with less, and every new uh, application change must be cost-justified cost justified in terms of actually providing a business benefit. We've all got things we'd like to do to our applications uh, that we think will be great, but unless it's actually driving business benefit, there's not much point in doing it. You know, it's actually going to be doing something that's going to improve the, 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 the bottom line of the company that we're working for. Okay. Uh, and we need to utilize the existing staff and resources that we've got in order to achieve that. We're, we're, typically, we're not being given extra budget in order to achieve this. We've got to do everything within the budget we have or perhaps even a, a, an ever-reducing budget. So I'm going to use two examples of, of uh, two, a couple of our clients. Uh, the first is a major European retailer. They have a large Datacom Ideal Medicable estate, and it runs almost all of their mission critical systems. Uh, they, only, they don't have a full-time DBA. They have 0.6 of a DBA, roughly three days a week. And they have their mainframe is now capped at 24 MSUs. And that's, over the last two years, we've actually reduced the MSU cap from 37 MSUs to 24 MSUs, giving them a real cost saving while actually improving the performance of the applications that run on the mainframe. The second one I'm going to use as an example is a financial institution. Again, Data Common Ideal is running almost all of their mission critical applications. Uh, they only have uh, a, a technical consultant for five days a month, so roughly 0.25 uh, of, a, of a person. Um, they've only got three mainframe developers, and their machine is capped at just 100 MIPS. That's a very, very small uh, limited machine in today's terms. Uh, but again, we're able to, to meet all of the targets and new applications and more data uh, within the, uh, the resources that we have. So um, from a product perspective, the so one thing I want you to take away from here today, uh, I hope we have got some, some people from developers, the development teams uh, on, online today. Um, we don't tend to hear from them very much in, in the Datacom community. Um, in terms of ideas that you would like to see. If, if we increase, add, a, add an enhancement to Datacom or Ideal or any of the other product components that we're talking about today that improves your productivity, then that's actually uh, improving the bottom line of the business because the faster you can develop applications, the, the, the more quickly the, the, the new product or the new feature, the new service goes to market effectively, it gets implemented, and that drives profits for the business. And business profits, business growth, means employment for all of us, uh, and it reduces the total cost of ownership of the mainframe. So if, if you have things that you come across that are a nuisance to you in your daily life from using Datacom and Ideal, uh, or you've got ideas for improving the product in any way, we'd really like to hear from you what, what your ideas are. And uh, CAL are very open to receiving those ideas, and we'll, with the new agile development that we have within CA, uh, they're very, uh, we can turn around these, these requests and get these new enhancements put in there. So don't assume that just because it's on a mainframe and it's Datacom and all the rest of it, that, that you just got to live with what Datacom does today. Um, we very much want to hear from you about what you'd like to, to see improved in terms of extra syntax or SQL or other things. So what are we talking about when we, when we uh, refer to application tuning? Well, one of the things that we've, we've made great strides down at our clients is identifying and eliminating redundant and inefficient processing. Redundant processing, here I'm talking about things, we found a lot of examples where um, in the past people used to receive printed reports uh, for a particular function, then it moved to CDs they would get, and then they get it sent as emails, but over time you know, those applications got uh, superseded or they're no longer required anymore, no one read those reports. And so they told the IT department, we don't read this report anymore, so can you stop, stop sending it, we don't read it. Now, the easiest thing for the IT people to do was to just turn off the bit that sends the report. You know, it's the safest thing to do. It's quick. You, stop, you satisfy the user's requirements. Um, but the problem is the mainframe is still going through and collecting and generating all the data to produce that report. They didn't go back and get rid of the, the schedule that was producing that report. So that's completely wasted processing. And the reason they didn't do that, perhaps the people who wrote that, that, uh, that schedule uh, have left the company. Um, and no one's quite sure how it works. And if I turn off all of these different jobs, I'm not sure what impact that's going to have on the rest of the schedule and other bits. So I won't do that. I'll just turn off the end bit. Well, that's, that's 
terrible for performance. You, you, you're wasting uh, time generating reports that no one's ever going to read. So going through, having a housekeeping exercise, um, which you can do completely without them changing any other code, just going through and looking at which bits of the schedule are still running that no one actually looks at the output from it. And we found a lot of those we've saved. Uh, typically 15 to 20% of processing we found was actually redundant. We could get rid of it. In efficient processing, we're going to look at how we're going to improve performance there. Uh, eliminating unnecessary outages and resource conflicts. Traditionally, back in the 80s and 90s, when people, a lot of these applications were written, uh, people took databases or tables offline in order to do some sort of maintenance. They would do a db extract, do something with the data, and then load it back up again. Um, well, those outages are, you know, they're, they're bad. They're actually bad for performance. We'll come on to why that is later on. Uh, but they're also causing outages, which then stops your 24-7 access. People who need to be able to do access to data through ODBC, JDBC, web, page, web services, and everything like that. So we need to eliminate those unnecessary outages, because a lot of the time, they are unnecessary now. The reasons for doing them were right back in the 80s and 90s, but it's not appropriate in this century. Uh, making full use of the hardware and infrastructure changes that have happened. You know, again, a lot of these applications were written at a time when the mainframes that we had were much smaller. Um, they had much uh, less memory and they had smaller CPUs. Um, we, have, we now have much bigger mainframes that run a lot faster, so we can make use of those rather than uh, and letting the database do the work uh, rather than having to do it in our applications. And obviously implementing enhancement that improves the business productivity. Uh, because that's what we're driving here. The more we get your business, your, your, your parent business to uh, function better uh, and generate more profits, uh, the more they are able to invest in and realize the value of the mainframe and the value of the data environments uh, so that we can continue enhancing them and it's a, it's a, it's a uh, virtuous cycle upwards. Okay, so the application architects that we have, Datacom has it's a single database, single database management system with three different APIs, application programming interfaces. There's, interfaces. There's record at a time, uh, which is uh, known as being very chatty. There's a lot of communication. Every row that you uh, retrieve is another request over to the database and a response back. Uh, so th that, that can be very, very quick in terms of just reading a, a, a direct read of a, of a row. But if you're tr processing large number of rows, it's uh, typically, the communication overhead is, is very heavy. Uh, also, because of the way record of the time works, you have to specify the key that you want to use. You can't specify columns that are not part of the key uh, in order to, to do your selection. So what people did was they read lots of rows, you read next, read next, read next, uh, and then had if statements in their program to select them out. So your application program is doing a lot of work um, to do the selection. And it has to do all the join work if you're getting data from multiple tables itself. And that's happening in your application region. One of the biggest changes that's happened in, in recent years on the mainframe in the ZOS uh, environment uh, is the introduction of a thing called a ZIP processor, which is a speciality processor just for uh, system server type uh, applications, uh, system server type products to, to run on. Uh, a bit like you have in your in laptop, you have a graphics processor that's a speciality processor just for doing the graphics. A zip processor is a speciality processor on the mainframe just for doing server tasks. And the great news in recent releases of Datacom is that 90 plus percent of the work that Datacom does can now run on this zip. Yeah? So it's taken the work off the main processor. So by moving stuff over to the zip and letting Datacom do the work, uh, that's much more efficient than you doing it in your applications. So record of the time applications, which in the past might have been the best way of doing it on a mainframe that didn't have a zip, now, because you are having to do the selection and the join work in your application, very often it's not the most efficient. It actually runs slower, uh, and it's all in chargeable uh, work on your general processor. So um, record of the time historically was very good. Uh, I would suggest that unless you've got very specific specialist tasks where, where you need to use record at a time, you should be moving away from record at a time. It does have this thing called GCEPL and get it commands for, for larger requests and responses, and we'll talk about that a bit later uh, on. Um, set at a time, this is less chatty. This is typically what you have if you're an ideal or meta shop with your four constructs, that's using set at a time. 
Uh, it's used by ideal data query and actually I, uh, SQL uses it under the covers for each of the tables that it accesses. So the selection work this time is zippable. So the aware clause is being processed by the multi-user on the zip, which is good. But the joining is done by your application because in order to join two tables together, you have to have a nested for construct. Uh, so that's not zippable because you're doing that within the uh, program. So again, you might be reading a lot of extra rows but, and only discarding a lot of those when you do the join work within your application. The third application uh, programming interface is SQL, uh, which is much less chatty with the database, much smaller number of requests, um, and you, you can do much more work on the database. Um, the, the request can include various uh, things to aggregate the data, so um, grouping by union, all of those sort of things. So the only data that comes back to your program are the few rows that you actually really need to process by this program. You're, you're doing most of the work over on the zip, which is much more efficient and far more, and far more cost effective than doing that. All the selection and join work can be done on the zip. Yeah? Under the covers, it's doing you set at a time for each one of the tables that it's joining, but it's doing all that join work in the, uh, in, in the multi-user. And I would strongly recommend for all sites, all new applications that you write from now onwards should be in SQL. Um, it's much, much faster. Uh, and uh, quite apart from the performance benefits, if you're talking about staff uh, and needing to train new staff, it's much easier to train staff in SQL particularly if they come from other platforms and they're used to it on, on other database management systems, they can transition to Dedicom SQL very, very quickly and easily. So that actually reduces your costs and your staff as well. Okay. All three of those, these APIs require a URT, uh, and we'll talk more about URTs in a little while. So just a quick reminder of, of, of how uh, the communication with the database works. Here we have a batch application. Uh, and that could be batch ideal, batch, pro, batch uh, metacobol, whatever, PL1. Um, and that under the covers is actually running, it's, it's calling DB entry with a list of parameters or it's calling DBSQLE if it's SQL. Uh, and it has a single thread across to the database, typically. Um, it's very rare to have more than one thread going across to the database. Yeah. So each request is going backwards and forwards to and from the, the database management system. And this is the multi-user address space over here. Multi-user, this is the thing that can be running on the zip effectively. 90% of its work is running on the zip. Uh, it owns all of the system data sets that you see here, uh, the uh, uh, datacom system data, uh, databases, things like data dictionary that you're familiar with, um, and all of your application databases. These are all owned here by the database management system. So all of this work in, in optimizing the path to find the, the quickest way to that data and retrieving that data is all done in the multi-user address space, and then it returns back the rows that come here. So if we're using record at a time, it's going to do one for one, back, forth, back, forth for each row that we're going to uh, retrieve. And that could be processing a million rows of which you only need to actually uh, uh, deal with in your program about 100 rows of the ones you're going to output from it. So very, very, a lot of communication over here, as you can see here. Whereas if we use SQL to say, you do all the work of finding out the 100 rows I want, you go trawling through the millions of rows and just return me the 100 rows I need, that's much more efficient. Okay? So that's a typical batch application. Uh, then we have Kix, uh, which has uh, a number of URTs. This batch uh, application program typically only has one URT. There are ways to use multiple URTs, but I'm not going to cover that today. Uh, typically, you only have one URT. Uh, in Kix address space, again, your programs are running according to DB entry and DBSQLE. Uh, but this time it's talking to a number of different URTs, and this is where you're able to open or close uh, using DBOC or DBEC uh, individual URTs in order to do some maintenance on them, um, and uh, they are shared amongst all the programs that run in the Kix address space. And this time we have a number of threads here. Here I've got three threads connecting through to the database, um, so multiple users will all be running lots and lots of Kix online programs. Uh, and they're sharing three concurrent connections in this case. And you can increase the number of connections that you have available if that is a bottleneck to you. Okay? So that's how Kix communicates with Datacom, but still Datacom is doing all the work. Uh, and then the third uh, method that we have for more modern applications now is for Datacom Server. Um, now, again, this has a number of connections uh, that are in here. Let me see if I can minimize that. There we go. Um, uh, so it's got a couple of connections I've got in here. Again, 
there is a way to do record of time, but very few people use it. So I'm going to stick with SQL. That's what everyone uses in ODBC and JDBC. You've got your end users doing uh, ODBC, JDBC requests, whether that's an Excel spreadsheet or a, a piece of Java or, or whatever, what other applications you've got. Um, community authentication again to cross the, the, the um, sorry, the multi-user address space to do the, the actual database work. Okay. That's not moving. Ah, good. Right, so why do we need to do tuning? So back when these applications were written, which may have been 10 or 20 years ago, we had to balance CPU versus I.O. versus a limited amount of real storage on the, on the mainframe. SASD was expensive in those days, so we wanted to minimize the amount of stuff we had on disk. Uh, we wanted to minimize, uh, we had to balance everything else between CPU, I.O. and storage. Uh, now, if we think how the mainframe has moved, if, even if you just took the standard upgrades, you can't buy a mainframe with only 64 meg on it anymore. It's just not possible. Um, you have a lot more storage than you did then. So where before you thought, right, I need to retrieve these rows one at a time, I process each one, and discard it before I process the next one. Now we can do far more um, to make use of the storage we have available. I'm going to talk about specific tips on that uh, in part two. Uh, similarly, again, how it's dated to the application process back then. Uh, the company was much smaller 20, 30 years ago. Hopefully your companies have grown over that time. So rows, tables that previously had 1,000 rows in them and an inefficient full construct in a, against 1,000 rows still completed within a second or two. Now that same table has got 10 million rows in it. Uh, so now if we have an inefficient full construct in there, it has a much more, um, it must be an impact on uh, the application performance. And I've seen sites where they've just gone, oh, the mainframe's performing slowly, we'll increase the CPU capacity. And that, in turn, has extra license fees to IBM and CA and other vendors and all the rest of it. Whereas if they actually look at how the applications are processing and tune them, they find that they don't need to increase that capacity, um, or at least not yet, uh, that they can run with the existing resources that they have uh, quite happily. So. Fundamentally, the applications might, might not have changed. It's still the same code that was written 20, 30 years ago, uh, but the, app, the environment they're running in certainly has. And certainly this zip processor is a game changer, the fact that, that uh, now CPU is not the enemy anymore because we can offload that to uh, work being done in the Vedicom multi-user address space and therefore on the zip, and I.O. becomes the, the big enemy that we have here. We also have much more real storage than we used to have, and DASD is far less expensive than it used to be. So the arguments for compression are much lower than they used to be. Yeah. Uh, if you're a VSC site and you don't have a zip. Okay. okay. So uh, the game changer is this thing, the zip. Uh, so 90 plus percent of the CPU can now be offloaded to that. So we really want to do as much work as possible within the database, within Datacom, and not in your applications. Yeah. Your user application uh, CPU cannot run on a zip. It's a, it's a it's a licensing issue with IBM. They won't allow your applications to run on it, but they will allow Datacom and SysView and all these other products to run on it, okay? So whenever you're doing a significant change to an application, or certainly when you're developing new applications, then you know, use that, that opportunity to swap for, from stuff you're doing within the application region to running it in the multi-user facility, yeah? Inexpensive and it's on the zip. And this is really where SQL hugely scores now, whereas Previously, it might not have done. So um, coming on to application tuning without changing the application, how can we change, how can we improve performance without even having to modify a line of code? So there's a number of application issues that we can, we can improve or deal with uh, just by adjusting the database environment. So uh, that could be things like adding new keys uh, or modifying keys, or in some cases, even deleting keys that are redundant and causing conflicts. Um, it can be uh, adding or removing compression where it's appropriate. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a number of things the DBA can do. So a lot of the DBA's work is, is in tuning things without, uh, without touching the, the application environment. But not every application issue can be resolved that way. And in part two, we're going to look at specific things to do with the application to, uh, to tune specific bits of code. So here we're looking at... Um, Change, improving the application without having to change the application code. First of all, uh, if, as long as we're not changing the uh, physical structure of the row, so we're not changing the row length or the length of the columns within that row, 
then uh, we can make changes to the database without uh, needing to touch or even recompile the program. So replacing physical I.O. with memory processing, so this is stuff the DBA would, would do, but you can influence them by saying, look, we've got a slowly running uh, application that's running against this table or this that particular database, please can you have a look at how we can improve the performance of that, that table, and your DBA should be able to look at that. So the biggest thing to do nowadays is, is actually just to increase the number of IXX, DXX, and data buffers, particularly now with Datacom 15.1, where we can have private buffer pools. Uh, you can also, in specialized circumstances, consider MRDF, uh, which is covered and virtual processing, uh, which may uh, um, improve the performance for specific tables that are really, really heavily hit, uh, and you need them to stay cached the whole time. But the, the argument for that is lower now that we have private buffer pools. So the, the recommendation now is to look at private buffer pools instead. Um, and if you are using covered, one thing that we noticed at, at one site, we had it all running and tuned fantastic. Uh, and then they IPL, they needed to bring the system down and re IPL, and they complained to us, oh, this is the first couple of days after um, uh, we re IPL'd, all the batch was running much slower. I said, well, yes, because that's because the cache is gone when we re IPL'd. So it might actually, might actually be a requirement to improve that performance that as part of the IPL process, or as soon as the IPL's uh, finished, you have uh, some little jobs that run through and populate. They read all the rows in, in the particular table that you've got in covered, just to repopulate that cache, so that by the time the users actually want to start using the system in anger in the, in the peak processing periods, it's already preloaded into the, into the covered areas. Uh, Another key change, most sites have adopted this, but I still come across some that haven't, change the block size to at least a third, a one third track or preferably half track. That's on a 3390, which most of you should be on third by now, um, that's 27998. Half track blocking should be the norm for all the database data sets. It should also be the norm for all your sequential files. You really shouldn't be writing small block sizes unless you really know that you're gonna be less, writing less than a block. Um, you know, everything should be half-track blocking now. It makes a huge difference, particularly to DB utility performance uh, if you're using half-track blocking. The factor of six performance improvement. Um, it does require adjustments of the data pool buffers, so data node, data node two, or, uh, or having these special data pools, private data pools in Datacom 15.1. Um, and it, huh, okay, this is actually out of date. Um, Changing the block size used to require an outage. You had to take a, data, a, a table offline. Now we have a table, table move 24, which is available in Datacom 15.1 now. Um, so uh, th that now you can change the block size on the fly while your applications are still running and open. So again, because all the processing that multi-user does is now on the zip, I've seen sites where they've, they've said, right, we've got plenty of DASD. DASD is cheap these days, so we'll remove compression from all our tables. And that can actually, it may have helped in performance when you were CPU constrained in the past, but it can actually ha uh, hurt um, performance of your applications now that we have a zip available. Because you actually have to read more blocks, more I.O. in order to retrieve the same amount of data. So now with the zip, there's a strong argument for reintroducing compression to a large uh, proportion of your tables where it's appropriate and you could do that using uh, um, table alter 24. Yeah, table, yeah, table move 24. Uh, yes, actually they're both, these are both table, table alter uh, functions, I think. Anyway, um, Datacom 15.1, you can reintroduce compression on the fly without having to do an outage. So have a look at that doing that. You may well find, because having read a single block, now instead of only getting 100 rows per block, you're now getting 1,000 rows in that one block. That actually improves performance. And all of the CPU work is being done on the zip, which is free. Yeah, it's not constrained uh, by your um, uh, your CPU cap in in any way. Okay, uh, other things that we can do here: um, adding keys to improve CBS and SQL efficiency. We're going to look uh, in the next session uh, at options that will allow us to do traces to, to work out how Datacom is determined you know, using a CBS trace or an SQL um, messages. Uh, which will tell you which keys it's, it's used and how much work it's done to retrieve your rows. Uh, if it's still poorly performing, uh, using, using the key that it's selected, uh, you can then go to the DBA and say, right, this application needs a different key in order to satisfy its requests. And uh, you know, we, we, we can now actually add uh, new keys on the fly. That was something that Kevin went through uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. 
Um, so you can add and delete keys and try them out uh, to find the, the optimum keys that are required for your application. Um, and it, right, if you do introduce new keys, uh, this is one of the disadvantages of record at a time, the RAT uh, API, uh, that, won't, that won't notice the new keys because with a record at a time application, you have to specify which key you want to use. But for your set at a time, that's your ideal MetaCobol or your SQL uh, requests, that comes into immediate effect. The, the moment the new key is there, SQL and your four constructs, if it's, if it's appropriate, if it's the fastest method to access this, this uh, request, deceptive by the where clause, it will start using it straight away. So we haven't changed anything in the application code, and we're suddenly using the new key. Yeah. Uh, if you do see in your uh, telecom stats that it's got a lot of temporary indexes, uh, then uh, run the CBS trace to find out, or use datacom accounting tables to work out which, which jobs or which programs are, are building temporary indexes, and look at potentially adding new keys, or we're going to look in part two at other ways we can eliminate uh, temporary indexes uh, without actually having to have a new key. Okay, removing unused keys. Yeah, un uh, having extra keys, you might think, oh, the more keys we've got, the better, the more options we've got to access the data. Actually, sometimes it can hurt, because if, if there are two keys that are quite similar uh, and, they, and neither of them exactly matches the where clause, then Dedicom can sometimes have to do uh, some statistical analysis called population counting uh, in order to determine which one of those keys is the best one to use. So unused keys, ones for historical programs that have been made redundant and decommissioned, um, remove those keys, both because it speeds up the add and update processing, because it's not having to maintain those keys for every new row you insert uh, or delete or, or maintain in some other way that, that touches the key. Um, uh, and uh, also because it eliminates unnecessary population counting for uh, Datacom to decide which of the keys is the most appropriate one. So uh, this, this query here will help you to identify um, the, the, the keys that may or may not be uh, still in use by the various different um, types of applications. So use, if it's still in use by, if a key is still in use by record at a time, then you can't just go ahead and delete it because that, that application will, fa will definitely fail um, because it's, it's using it in a record at a time and that specified that key. So there you would need to modify the program. But if it's, in, in, if it's hardly ever used in set at a time or SQL you, uh, and it's causing a performance issue, uh, then you can delete that key and set at a time and SQL will now choose from the remaining available keys in order to find them the best access path. Okay, on to DB utility. How much? Yeah, 18 minutes. Okay. Um, DB utility tuning. Um, now, I've, I've come across sites who said, they said to me, oh, we've got a major performance issue. We want, to, want you to look at the schedule. And I said, well, let's start with DB utility. Um, and they said to me, oh, well, DB utilities don't run for about five minutes. So we're not, bothered, not worried about DB utility. Look at the application. I said, okay, so around five minutes, how many of them you've got in your batch application schedule? Oh, we've got hundreds. Uh, right, okay. We made some simple changes to DB utility uh, tuning in terms of buffers and uh, the way that the DB utility cards were, were coded. And just by doing that, we shaved an hour off the critical path of the overnight batch. Yeah? So again, we didn't change any application code. Just by changing the utility, we saved an hour of the overall batch window, and the client was very happy just to do that. It was a very quick win. So many application job streams do use the utility steps within them, and the faster we run that, the faster the job stream can complete. That's obvious. Uh, again, in the past, people had a lot of things to perform uh, offline reorg, so they would take the database offline to do some sort of reorg or do a retix to rebuild the index and free up some space in the index on a regular basis of housekeeping. Um, new functions that replace those, uh, defrag for the index and online reorg, uh, and there's even uh, table move 24 in Datacom 15.1 as well, which takes it even further. Um, should be, you should look at that uh, to replace anywhere you're doing retixes or, re or traditional reorgs both to eliminate unnecessary outage windows, you really should be moving towards 24-7. Even if you don't need it today, I guarantee you're going to be asked for it sometime in the future. As more and more things go open, and open up to uh, other platforms, people want 24-7 access. So eliminating uh, those offline reorgs and offline retixes uh, is, is good for 24-7 um, access. But actually, what we found, particularly with defrag and retix, 
Vfrag runs much faster than Retix. This, this thing runs, it reorganizes the index, uh, does a, a, a terrific job of, of, of uh, effectively uh, improving the performance of the index, even though all your applications are still online, even your update applications are still online uh, and doing that. And it runs, typically runs in less than 25% of the time that the traditional RESTIX takes. Also, again, because Vfrag and Online Reorg are running within the multi-user facility, remember I said the multi-user facility can run on the zip. So that's all processing that's done you know, off the main uh, general processes. So again, it's being done in the free processor that we get in the zip, um, and it's freeing up resource, whereas your Retix and your, your um, traditional backup and load type reorgs are being done in the application region, and they invoke sort, and sort is a very CPU intensive thing to do. Uh, and you know, therefore you're consuming uh, non-zip general processor uh, CPU, which can put you with everything else, all your applications. So definitely look at converting to using Dfrag, online reorg, or even table move 24 in, in uh, Dedicom 15.1. Other, th other quick wins for DB utility tuning, uh, region equals zero meg. Uh, don't have four meg or eight meg. Uh, put that in the JCL exec in ZOS. If you're a ZVSC site, uh, do have a, a large partition, 50 meg partition, um, for your DB utility jobs. Trust me, it's worth it. Um, and change the master list, the, the, the uh, utility master list, and ramp up the index, the IXX, DXX, and data buffers. Give it a lot more of those, especially in a VSC environment. In ZOS, it, it overrides to a certain extent, but you can make it even better if you give it more buffers, uh, particularly for your backups, your loads, any of those kind of functions of references. Uh, that you are still doing, because there are still valid reasons for doing those if you're loading data from external data sources, then tuning the master list and running in a big partition or a large region, you will find that, uh, for example, the sort package uh, will make use of the extra space that you give it. If you confine it to, to 4 meg, the sort package has got a lot less space to work in um, uh, within the region, and it ends up having to use sort work files, which is I.O. and expensive. Uh, the more it can do stuff locally, or in some sort of packages use a base space or a hyperspace, let it do that. Half track blocking, I mentioned this before, please go to half track blocking for all your data areas, pretty much all of them. There's very, very few cases where it should be uh, less than half track. Uh, area level controls, again, in the past, people had to take the whole database offline, they did an access off for DBID 438 uh, in order to do some maintenance to that uh, one table in that database, because that was the only way you could do it. In newer releases of data commons, it's been around for a long time, but I've seen a lot of sites that are still running, they're taking the whole database offline just to do, to do some maintenance work on one table. Introduce area level controls, so you only take that one table offline uh, and use multi-use equals yes. Um, it eliminates negative dependencies in your scheduler, right, where things are being prevented from running against a particular job because it's taking that one table offline, but these other jobs were accessing other tables in the database. Um, and you know, it, it, in most cases, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a definite winner. Um, there are a few cases you, you, that uh, area level controls can actually make performance uh, slower. So depending on the size of the database and the requirements that you have, um, you know, it, it, give it a try, see how it works on a case-by-case case basis, but it can definitely reduce the number of contentions that you have where you're having to take a database offline unnecessarily. Uh, block size, for ZOS sites, uh, it's, uh, if you're a ZOS site with SMS and managing your block sizes, then that's fine. Uh, sorry, if, if, you're not, if you're not talking, to, just put your phone on mute, please. Um, the, uh, yeah, if you're a ZOS site with, uh, with SMS, then you don't need to worry about block size, but if you're using non-SMS, or if you're a VSE site, very important for your backup and extract data sets, code the block size as 27998, make it half-track blocking. Um, otherwise, you end up with a 4K block size, which is very poor for performance. The load and retics parameters, uh, these are some fairly, these are, these are things that I'll just recommend you just do. Um, code K bytes equals 9999. Always code optimize equals yes on a load or retics. Always code option one equals I, and review the sort messages. It costs virtually nothing to produce these sort messages, but it can give you really big hints to things you can do in your sort package that will improve the performance of the sorts that you're running within Load and Retix. Uh, sort value, get it correct. Um, this require, the, right, this specification for VSC, actually, I'm gonna change this now. In Datacom release 12 in VSC, which is the latest version we have, 
actually code sort equals the right value now. In the past, it didn't matter. For ZVSE in release 12, uh, now you should code it as the right number. But for ZOS, all ZOS sites, get it as the, the, the number of index entries. Yeah? So that's number of keys. If you're looking at the table structure, it's number of keys times number of rows for uh, this particular area, if you're just loading one area. Or if you're doing a database level load, you need to sum the values of the number of keys times the number of uh, rows um, for each of the tables that are in that database. If you code that correctly, it makes a big difference to the way the, the sort works. Now, new in release 14 and uh, above is an option, rather than you having to code that manually uh, in, your, in your JCL, sort default equals yes um, will do that calculation for you on the fly, which is great if you've done, if you're, if you're uh, taking a backup uh, and then loading it back up again, perhaps doing a traditional type reorg, which I've said we should probably get away from, but anyway, if you are doing that, it will look at the backup, it'll work out how many rows there were in there, uh, because that's that information stored in the backup um, and work it out, uh, work out the correct sort value and it, it improves the performance. Uh, I say great if used wisely. Uh, I have seen sites that just imposed sort default everywhere, uh, but they had some jobs that were doing a backup, great, of you know, a million rows, but they were, they were loading up data from some external platform, perhaps from a, a, you know, a, a Linux uh, system. And the number of rows they were rowing, that, that were um, loading was, was greatly different to what was uh, defined in the CXX or the backup data set. So if they're, since they were restoring from an external source that wasn't a backup data set, it was an extract type data set, it didn't know how many rows there should be, so it looked at the CXX and calculated the wrong sort value and hurt performance. But sort default, for the vast majority of your sort, sort default equals yes uh, is a very good new feature, and it saves you having to keep coming back and adjusting these sort values uh, on a regular basis. So look at these new features that are in here. Uh, replace most of your references with defrags. I've talked about that already. Uh, on, if you're doing extracts, look at the fact that the new feature that's come in, you may have missed, there's a first key, last key. So if you were previously doing an extract to the full table and then feeding it into some sort of sort to, to cut down the, the result set to just the ones you want, now you can do that directly in the extract by specifying first key and last key. Kevin mentioned this the other day. Everywhere, 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 you should have your indexes initialized with old EP equals no. So if you've got any JCL that's doing an init of an IXX, add this extra parameter on there. Yeah, um, old EP equals no. no I, I don't know of any site that's running ancient code from the, the, the 1960s that used those old entry points. Everyone is using DB entry or above now. Um, so make sure that you've got that. It makes the index much more efficient. Uh, I talked about those, those features um, like k-bytes and optimize and all those sort of things. There's a new feature called DBI and 1PR and a sit in first, which will apply these either as defaults or force them as overrides. So we've done this at sites. Rather than having to go through and change all of our DB utility jobs, and there were thousands of them, um, we actually coded it in here, k-bytes equals 9999 uh, as a force option. So even if the, if, if, the, if the load didn't have k bytes, it adds it on. If it did have k bytes equals 280, which was an old optimal value from, from, from uh, eight, uh, many years ago, it overrides it with 9999. Or you can specify it as a default instead, and then only if it doesn't have an existing k bytes feature, uh, uh, parameter, then it will apply it. So this is a way to, in, a, in one quick shot, update all your DB utility JCL using these, these sysin first and DBI and 1PR. It's all in the book. I have to do this. So for us, DB utility tuning saves several elapsed hours for many jobs, and overall on the critical path, we saved an hour. So it was a big, big, big uh, benefit to us. Uh, another thing to look at, I've talked about replacing uh, traditional reorgs and, and retixes with uh, defrags and online reorgs and 7 with 24, um, but also look at whether you really should be reorging at all. If your applications are actually doing random processing, then reorging the database, reading all the table, is not actually going to give you any significant benefit. You're, meanwhile, you're taking the database offline, or even if you're doing an online reorg, you're consuming resource in order to do that. Um, so look at the data and see if you really should be doing the reorgs. I've had sites where we've removed over 60% of the reorgs because they really weren't giving any benefit, or they were reorging too often. Uh, and we said, right, no, for, the, for this one, a monthly reorg or a quarterly reorg is much more appropriate. Again, you're saving resource that's running on the mainframe. Uh, and the history database now in the new releases of Betacom in ZOS only, I'm afraid, um, 
uh, provides that sequential activity, which will tell you um, whether you're actually getting any benefit from the reorgs. There's also a data, data native efficiency report, again, in new releases of Datacom, um, which shows how efficient your, your tables are in terms of native sequence access. Uh, the traditional backups, native sequence and load, um, I've mentioned use area levels controls only if the min only but only if a minority of the areas need a, a reorg. Yeah. Um, if you are doing if you're reorging all your all your tables in a, a database, do a database level um, uh, backup and load. That's much more efficient. Again, you might find jobs out there that are uh, the code backup for each individual area and then load each individual area. That's much less much less efficient than doing a backup a database level backup. Uh, initialize the index and then do a database level load. Parallel reorg, uh, okay, this is now, it was, it was new technology a few years ago, but now I would say it's very rarely uh, used because now new table move 24 is, is probably the way you should be looking at uh, doing reorgs now. Uh, online reorg, uh, ref group equals zero will give you a perfectly reorganized um, uh, data set. Uh, by having a larger reference group, and then there's whole sections on this uh, in DocOps uh, on what, how to choose the optimum value for this, um, will give you a well reorganized, but not perfectly reorganized. So well enough that it's giving you good performance uh, of your online, of your, of your applications, without having uh, the performance overhead of doing a ref group equals zero perfect online real. I can update this, it's not currently planned for, it's in Datacom 15.1 now, table move 24, which will allow you to do a, uh, an online reorg with no outage and you get a perfect reorganized copy of the database or, or the table and you can resize at the same time. Table move 24 is a great new feature in 15.1. Anyone who's not on 15.1, it's a, it, this alone is a good reason to upgrade um, and uh, certainly for, for, for all the reasons you know, in terms of management and, and performance, it's a great uh, option to have. Uh, partitioning, again, right, again, without touching your application, uh, if you've got a huge database with, with tens of millions of rows in it, which is big and unwieldy and, and difficult to manage uh, and poorly performing because it's got a huge index to, to plow through, um, you can consider partitioning that table. Uh, if we take customer orders, for example, typically you only want to look at the last month's worth of orders, but you might have to keep years' worth of orders for historical reasons. You know, by partitioning just the long, last month's worth of orders into its own table, that table is much smaller, much more efficient, has a much more efficient index uh, that you can access. And if you need to take things offline to do maintenance, it's a much shorter outage window to just reorganize a small table than a huge one. Okay. Right. Uh, oh, I'm running out of time. Right, so change the physical structure of the database. Uh, I'm going to run through these quickly. So if you have data areas that have two or more heavily used tables, then consider splitting that up into larger databases that have multiple tables. There are now options in the URT, uh, MUF DBID, where you can remap. Again, without changing your application program, it still thinks it's talking to database 123, uh, and in fact, it's talking to database 234. Because you've checked, you've moved that table into a different database, and you're using the URT, URT to remap it. Uh, again, by splitting it out into a separate database, you're improving the the, um, the performance of the utilities that are running against it. Uh, we have smaller indexes, we have reduced levels of index, and more opportunities to use covered tables to to improve the performance by caching it. Uh, also, what, that's splitting out large tables from a, a a database, large whole tables. The second way you can look at it is splitting out a single large table using table partitioning. I've just mentioned, I've talked about this already, really. So again, your existing applications remain unchanged. They still think they're talking to table ABC, but in fact, when it's processing through the rows, it's, it's looking at the different partitions, typically the main partition that you want to look at uh, is separated out physically. So these are all things the DBA can do to improve the performance of your application without you having to change the application code itself. Okay, uh, looks like I'm just about on time. Uh, so I'm gonna open this up to questions here. I rushed through things, apologies for rushing through this. I'm gonna rush through the next session even more because I've got even more things to go through there. Uh, if I've touched on a subject and you want more details on there, please feel free to contact me at my email address here anytime. Uh, but if anyone's got any questions now, I'll open it up for questions. Oh, 
done, uh, this is Kevin, uh, have you done much with uh, multiple data set indexes? Oh, I didn't see here. Multiple data set indexes. Yes, I can hear you, Kevin. Um, right, we actually haven't uh, done that, splitting out the indexes. Uh, we haven't had a need to. What we, what we have been doing, again, because we inherited a lot of stuff uh, that was historical, there were a lot of, table, a lot of databases that had huge tables you know, multiple millions of rows next to tiny tables, which is right. bad for performance generally. Right. Um, so we've been focusing really on splitting out uh, those right. uh, those tables into their own database. Uh, we haven't we haven't got to the stage yet of needing to split out an index. We, we don't have firstly we, we don't we don't have tables that are that huge uh, as a single table. Okay, I was just wondering because you know, that's. When you were talking about partitioning to use more MRDF and whatever, you can also obviously yeah. you know partition an index. It's not really partitioning no, index; it's, I didn't it's separating it by, by key ID, but uh, it does provide some benefit yeah. there. So, thank you. I just was wondering. No, it, yeah, no, it, it does, and we've certainly seen that. And actually, some of my uh, colleagues from other databases heard about partitioning and said, oh, yes, we've had major benefits of doing this right. in other database management systems. You should look at doing it in Datacom. And it, it, it's something we will look at in the future um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And you're absolutely right about the ability to cover a much smaller, smaller table much more easily uh, or a much smaller index uh, more Ooh. easily. Um, but we haven't got to it yet. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, since there's no other questions, we're going to go ahead and stop this WebEx, and then we'll be back at the top of the hour. Thanks, everybody.